What exactly does the law say? Now, section 67, subsection 2 of Nigeria's 1999 constitution, as amended, gives the Senate powers to summon ministers for any reason whatsoever. Does that power include the power to summon permanent secretaries as well? At least as long as ministers haven't been appointed, these and many more legal questions I will be asking today on the program. Well, hello and welcome. This is 60 Minutes with me, Angela Jetumobi. Thank you for joining me on the program today. Now, the truth is there is no end to the legal questions arising within Nigeria's political space. And that's why this episode of a special 60 Minutes with Angela concentrates on what exactly the law says. Today we'll be looking at the power of the Senate to summon ministers, the effect of defections within the legislature and the executive. Chapter 3 of Nigeria's constitution also talks about citizenship. What are the pitfalls for politically exposed persons who have dual citizenship? Well, join me after the break. As I count down 60 minutes with Muyo Shuri Onibanjo, a senior advocate of Nigeria and our legal consultant on 60 Minutes with Angela. Welcome back. Welcome, Mr. Onibanjo. Thank you very much for coming back on the program. It's a pleasure. But first, well, Nigeria's President Muhammadu Buhari recently visited the United States of America from July 19. To July 22. Joining me on the phone now from the presidential villa in Abuja, the federal capital territory, is his special advisor on media and publicity, Femi Adishina, who will be doing our weekly presidential update. Now, the president's visit, July 19 to 22, to the United States, people are still talking about that trip, but I'm trying to focus on the takeaways from that trip. President Obama did make some pledges. Can you highlight those pledges to us? Well, a couple of takeaways. There is one that is dearest to my heart, and it is not tangible. It's an intangible takeaway, but then it's very, very important. That for me is about reputation of Nigeria, flowing from the Nigerian president. The Nigerian was seen as a fraudster, as a drug Korea as a drug user, he was associated with all sorts of negative things. And whenever they saw the green passport at the early immigration point, yes. the red light flashes in their mind. But then here you have the president of the most influential country in the world saying this Nigerian president is a man of integrity. And he came into office with a clear cut agenda. I think that's a very great one for Nigeria. It's not only about the president, you will see that it will percolate, yes. it will go down, it will redound to the good of all Nigeria. Because when the leader of the free world says, this country has been led by a man of integrity, it will evaporate throughout the world. And here, Ambassador Johnny Carson, too, at the United States Institute of Peace, when our president visited, he said, this is a man of honor, this is a man of integrity. Americans are not extravagant with their presence. American leadership. But you see them at every turning president, President Muhammad Buhari. And you know them, they are not frivolous. Mm. They wouldn't be so effusive in their presence if they had not checked him out. They had checked him out that they knew that yes, he deserved all the accolades and they gave those accolades. Mm. So for me, it's an intangible benefit of that visit, but very, very important that Nigerian leadership and by extension Nigerians themselves have been seen in a new light. Now, after that, let me talk about the tangible ones. And in the tangible ones, I'd like to break them into two. Yes. 
the low hanging fruits and the ones that are still up there, which will drop with time after the ripe. So, for the low hanging fruit, there were many meetings between our president and the American establishment. You see, when you go to a country and you meet the president, you meet the vice president, you meet the secretary of state, you meet the secretary for commerce, you meet the secretary for defense, you meet all sorts of people. I tell you, it's, it's, it's good benefit to your country. And our president met all these people. He met the attorney general. The attorney general said, America will help Nigeria to trace all stolen money from her coffers, not only in the U.S., but in all the U.S. jurisdictions. I think that is quite heavy. Yeah. That is quite important. Anywhere the U.S. has influence and Nigeria's money is salted away, they will help us to retreat. And the Attorney General said again, they will train our anti craft agents, very important, EFCC, SEPC, they will train all the agents. And they will train our prosecutors. All these are very, very important things for our country. Promises that Nigeria came back with. A lot of people thought uh, the president will come back carrying Apache helicopters, Cobra helicopters that he brought. Yes, and, and, and you know, Mr. Adishino, the, the opposition, Mr. Adishino, the opposition is saying that, in, in fact, the trip was a farce. I would have been surprised if the opposition said anything different. You know, this was a party that had threatened to keep us in the slave market for a minimum of 60 years. And in just 60 years, they were given a bloody nose and booted out of power. You wouldn't expect them to be singing the praises of the party that shook them out of office. So, that they, uh, the, the PDP said what he should have said. Oh, it's only that uh, it appears hollow and it appears very, very laughable. PDP is just beginning to get used to playing in opposition. In 15 years, it never tasted. In fact, since it was founded, it never tasted opposition. Yeah. So it's just learning the ropes. And like a child learning to walk, they will first rise and fall and stumble. And that's what is happening to PDP. So I am not surprised. They have the right to have their opinion and they have said it. But it doesn't make it correct. In fact, a lot of people will love them to be rich. Because we know that this was the most, most successful case. What do you say to those uh, who believe the headlines that are saying the United States was a little bit disappointed with the entourage? They thought the president and uh, the whole entourage appeared unprepared. I don't know if you have heard that or read that anywhere uh, online. Uh, it, it, is, it is not true. And... Uh, if there was ever a headline like that, maybe it had some PDP influence. <laughs> then that is not true. In yeah. fact, the, the impression I had was that the United States was quite pleased with that visit, quite pleased with the interact. If there was ever a headline like that, maybe there was some uh, influence behind that headline. <laughs> All right. The same people who said the visit was not successful may have been behind that headline. Okay, and I, I have to ask you this question because uh, a lot of the students who are benefiting from scholarships granted by the Presidential Amnesty Program have reached out to me about the uncertainty surrounding their continuing education with the stalemate. Many of them haven't received their May allowances and the body language of this administration is showing like the Amnesty Program will end. And so, you know, I have to ask you, what will be the fate of those who have done about two years, for instance, in university? We understand some have graduated, they haven't been given their certificates because they are still owing. Some have actually been kicked out uh, because they are owing. What is this administration going to do and how soon will it do it? The president has made a declaration about amnesty yes. that it, it will continue, at least for now. But it needed to be studied and reviewed. Like almost everything with the former administration, yes. there was a lot of lack of transparency in the amnesty thing. As I speak to you, the president has the file. Yes. He's studying it. And soon the pronouncement will come yes. on that. But I don't believe that students who are almost uh, finishing with their programs will have to forfeit the time they are spent. No. Yes. They just need to be patient a little bit. They, they will finish. But 
there is a lot of rust that needs to be cleaned, even in their MST program. If President Buhari came into office on the wings of change, and he comes in and continues to also build on the foundation of rot he made, then where is the change? So it may not be long, but something will be done about the amnesty program. And the ill treatment of former First Lady Patience Jonathan, apparently on orders from above, she was prevented from using the VIP lounge at the Port Harcourt International Airport. What would you be your comment on that? Yes, let me just let me just correct that. Yes. She was prevented from using the presidential lounge, not the VIP lounge. There is a presidential lounge yes. that has the insignia of the office of the president. Right. That was where she wanted to use and she was prevented. And there were no orders from above. The president didn't know about it. Yes. The airport officials just did what they needed to do. Right. There is a VIP lounge, that is where she should have gone. Okay. But she wanted to use the presidential lounge, which she had no right to, because she's not a sitting president or wife of a sitting president. Right. So I think it's just a matter of mm. over, uh, wanting to overreach herself mm. and the, the officials, the diplomatic officials at the airport corrected it. Okay. And the presidency had nothing to do with it. In fact, the presidency didn't know about it. But if she is not in office yes. and her husband is not in office, she should not have attempted to use the presidential lounge. If she wanted to use the VIP lounge, nothing wrong. Okay, thank you for that clarification. Now, on the appointment of ministers, as we wait with bated breath for Mr. President to appoint those ministers, stories have been making the rounds about 33 men failing the, the security test, the integrity test, and of course that comment about only men of integrity will be appointed as ministers. Well, some are reading meanings into that, thinking that there possibly is a clash between the president and the party about selection of his ministers. No, there, there is no, there is no clash between the president and the party. Yeah. And uh, that theory that had made the rounds that uh, of 36 people only, only three yes. still yeah. devoted yes. is, is, is not true. It's not true. It's just the product of the fertile imagination of somebody who posted it online and the story developed a life of its own. Of its own. Like that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And uh, talking of the president and the party, no, they are together. Yes, he is the president. He may have more say in deciding and picking those who are going to work with him. But let's not forget that he emerged on the platform of the party. Yes. So the party will also have a say. And I can't let you go without talking about the anti-same-sex marriage matter and the way it was handled by Mr. President in the United States. You do know that Nigerians think it was a bargaining chip and that possibly because Mr. President didn't agree to ban that law, that's why the United States is still refusing to sell us arms. No, no, that would not be quite right. Mm. You know that uh, Mr. President swore to uphold the Nigerian constitution. That yes. was the oath of office he took. And uh, there is a law in Nigeria banning same-sex marriage. I, I think it even carries a jail term of 14 years or something. Yes. So, if, if, if there is a law in Nigeria banning same-sex marriage and a president goes outside the country and subscribes to same-sex marriage, mm. it's even an impeachable offense because he would then have contravened the constitution he swore to uphold. Yes. And before the trip, you know, that was a, a big issue. People thought the, the President Obama himself was going to raise that matter and uh, uh, passions were high. Yes. But Fortunately, when the two presidents met, nothing like that came up. Okay, it, it only came up at the joint sitting of the Senate and the House. Yes, yes that's where I'm, I'm driving to. Mm. It was not even the full Senate and full House. It was just a committee, the Foreign Affairs Committee of the Senate and the House. Yes. When they hosted our president, they had talked about many things, including democracy, defense mm. and all that. And then one said, go ask, by the way, what will be the attitude of the Nigerian government to the rights of gays and homosexuals? Yes. And our president uh, uh, told them, frankly, decently, the Nigerian law forbids it. And he said, not only does the law forbid it, Nigerians themselves abhor it. Our culture 
uh, religion, everything abhors same sex marriage. Yes. And that was where it, 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 his host respected his opinion, and that was how they didn't push the matter. So, for anybody to say that was why we didn't get arms, that would not be right. Okay. No, you couldn't have got arms after four days. You couldn't. <laughs> Those who think the president will come back flying in a cobra helicopter or Apache and all that, yes. rolling tanks, they miss this. It doesn't work that way. And can you now clarify what exactly uh, the president said about constituencies that gave him 97% not being yeah. treated equally? With the, uh, with the, the five percent, I just urge you. You know, there's uh, there's some great deal of this chief in this country. Those who are behind that, what I call storm in a tickle, those who are behind it, they took a part of the president's statement and uh, made it go viral. They didn't take the entire thought. If you have the time, listen to the president, listen to his entire thought. What did he say? When the, that lady asked me a question about the Niger Delta and all that. And yes. the president started by saying, yes, it's natural in politics that if you get more votes, 97% from an area, you favor that area more than where you got 5%. Yes. And then he went on to say, but the Nigerian constitution already protects every part of the country. And he, as a person, believes in fairness and justice. So he will ensure that no part of the country is marginalized. But those who now are spreading that disinformation, they took the earlier part of his statement where he said, yes, if you get 97%, you favor them more than where you get 95%. And that was where they stopped the clip. Take time and listen to his entire talk. You will see that he balanced it. He said the constitution already protects every part of the country and he will ensure that no part is marginalized, that he believes in fairness and justice. Mm. That was the complete talk. And what is Mr. President's reaction to the fact that they're calling him Mr. Go Slow? Yeah, he responded to that on the, uh, in the town hall meeting with Nigerians in diaspora. He said, yes, he hears they're calling him about Go Slow. Yes, he will be slow, but he will be steady. Okay. And I think that just answers it. When you are slow and you are steady, you end up winning the race. The person who tries at great next speed can indeed break his neck along the way. <laughs> I hope you took it with a tinge of humor. Oh, you know, Mr. President, <laughs> uh, a lot of people don't know that side of him. Mm. Oh, if the man can crack jokes, he can laugh, but uh, Nigerians don't know that side of him. So yeah. he took that with a mm. tinge of humor. And uh, on a final note now, I have to talk about his entourage. People yeah. say that his war against impunity is shaken by the fact that his son was on that official trip to the United States. And of course, we saw photographs of the wife of a governor as well on that yeah. entourage. The president has the right to travel with as many as three or four members of his family. That's the protocol. Every time President Jonathan traveled, didn't he travel with his wife? Is that not a member of the family? When Bill Clinton would travel, didn't he travel with Chelsea? Yes. Is that not a member of the family? When Barack Obama travels, doesn't he travel with his two daughters and with Michelle? Are they not members of the family? So those who are saying that do not know. But the protocol people will tell you that a Nigerian president can travel with up to three or four members of the family. Whenever Yara Dua used to travel, they say he will travel with two members of his family and his grandchild. No, those who are saying that do not know, do not know, and we can forgive them for not knowing. Okay. And then talking of uh, uh, Shomale's wife. Yes. Oshiamale was on the delegation, but he didn't travel with the president. He was not on the presidential guest, to or fro. He had traveled ahead. Maybe he and the family were on, on vacation or holiday. He had traveled ahead. And we never saw the wife until the day that President Buhari met Nigerians in diaspora. That was the day oh. came, she came with the husband. So how would everybody say she was on the presidential share mm. She was not there. So that's the truth about traveling with his son and uh, Oshomalo traveling with his wife. Thank you very much, Mr. Adishino, for finding time again to speak with us. Of course, we'll be back next week with our weekly presidential update. Thank you. Thank you. It's been my pleasure. Join us again after the break.
It is difficult to respond to that question. Angela, that's a great question. Great question, Angela. Angela, that is a very great question. That's a great question. Okay, that's a great question. Yeah, very good question. That's a good question. This is an interesting question you put. 60 Minutes with Angela. Again, answers to every question you always wanted to ask. Welcome back. If you've just joined us, it's 60 Minutes with me, Angela Ajetumobi, on my hot seat today, Moyo Shori Onibanjo, Senior Advocate of Nigeria. Now, Mr. Onibanjo, I wanted us to start with Section 67, Subsection 2, because a lot of noise has been made about the refusal of a permanent secretary in the Ministry of uh, Finance to respond to the summons of the Senate. Section 67, subsection 2 says that the Minister of the Government of the Federation shall attend either House of the National Assembly if invited to explain the conduct of his ministry and in particular when the affairs of that ministry are under discussion. So there's no doubt that if a minister was in that ministry, he would have no reason not to attend the summons. Yes. That's does this section cover a permanent secretary as well? Well, the, the section does not because it clearly states a minister of the government of the federation. Yes. The permanent secretary is not a minister mm -hmm. of the government of the federation. And some people argue that because the permanent secretary is like the chief accounting officer of, of a ministry, if they're talking about the finances, surely he's the kind of person anyone would let, want let, to speak let, with. Let us just, let us just um, clarify issues. Firstly, yeah. sec under Section 67.2 of the Constitution, as yes. amended, the National Assembly cannot rely on that section to summon the permanent secretary. Why not? Well, because clearly the section refers only to a minister. minister. Mm. If the question is, does the National Assembly have powers to summon officers or civil servants, as mm. the permanent secretary is, mm. the answer is yes. But the power does not come from section 67 two, right. but it comes from section 88, mm. 1A, B, 1 and 2. Okay, of the Constitution. Of the Constitution. So if people are worried that does the National Assembly, can they summon a civil servant, mm. the answer is yes. yes. Okay. Under section 88, they can. Okay. Section 88 of the Constitution contains what is called the powers of oversight mm. of the National Assembly. That section gives them power to summon any official yes. of the federal government in issues pertaining to one, areas in which the National Assembly can make laws, and two, to summon anybody who is involved in carrying out any law or spending any money appropriated by the National Assembly. So if you look at under those two criteria, they can summon you in any area in which they have powers okay. to make laws. Okay. Two, they can summon any state official who is involved in either implementing any law passed by the National Assembly mm -hmm. or spending any monies appropriated by the National Assembly. Right. Now these powers have been vested on them with a view to ensuring that they make better laws or yes. they am amend existing laws. Mm -hmm. So where for example, the law is passed, the law is not implemented to the letter, mm -hmm. they can now summon officials of the government involved in implementing those laws to come and state yes. what is the reality on the ground. Why have you not These laws so difficult. Yes. Why? So those ones will respond that, well, this is what, such and such and such a, is what we, the reality on the ground. And what the National Assembly is expected to do is to now use that information for better lawmaking process. What would you say then to those who say, even if the Senate will be summoning a permanent secretary, because the permanent secretary is a civil servant, they need written approval from the uh, secretary to the government of the Federation. In other words, before a permanent secretary can respond to such a summons, he must take permission from the secretary to the government of the federation before he may be allowed to speak 
only because he's a civil servant. That it would be a wrong assumption because, mm. you know, as far as supremacy of law goes in Nigeria, the constitution yeah. is the grand norm, that's the ultimate law. Everybody, including the secretary to the state government, yes. permanent secretaries, ordinary Nigerian citizens, the president of Nigeria, the National Assembly itself, are bound by its provisions. Mm. So if the Constitution says in Section 88 that the National Assembly has powers to summon any official of the state, yes. then those powers cannot be overridden by any procedure mm. enacted by any subordinate authority. All right, let's go to defections now. Of course, since the All Progressives Congress won the presidential election, we've seen a lot of people moving from one party to the other. What does the Constitution say about defections? People say when they defect, they should lose their seats or lose their posts. And I don't think it's that straightforward in this Constitution, is it? No, it is not. The thing is that there are three arms of government. The Constitution only provides, I believe, in Section 67 yes. and Section 109. The Constitution only restricts what we call cross-carpeting. Yes to the legislative arm. So section 67 deals with the National Assembly, mm -hmm. while section 109 deals with the this State House of the Assembly. Yes. Now, a member of any of those bodies who is elected on the platform of a political party cannot move to another political party. If he does so, he automatically loses his seat. Right. except where there is a division in the political party by which he was elected yes. into the respective House legislative, or, or yeah, whether Senate. state or Senate or, nas or national. Uh, House so of the Senate. only ground on which I can move parties is if I can show that my party has a faction, it's yes. factionalized. Yes, it, 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 that is the only time that a member of parliament can decamp Hmm. and leave party A for party B, yes. where there is a division in the party on which ticket it got into the assembly. Okay. Who determines if there's a faction? You know that we both can be in the same party and hmm. we're both saying different things. You say it's not factionalized. Hmm. I say it is. What test will determine which way this will go? The judiciary, the third arm of government, is the one vested with the powers to determine, in this case, whether there is a division in a political party. We have had a couple of cases yes. which went up, all right all the way to the Supreme Court, in which the Supreme Court has said that the division must be extreme. You must have two chairmen, you must have maybe two board of trustees, Yes. And it all must, running per pari per all, all, all running parallel yes. at the same time. It must be a division that is clear to everybody. The reasonable man in the street must mm. be able to say, oh, that party mm. is, is divided. Okay. So, and so once that is done, how does the process start for anyone to lose his seat upon defection? Don't you need the support of the leadership of either of the houses or the National Assembly? Once there's a division, yes. and let's say I was elected on the platform of Party A into my State House of Assembly, I will now just write to the Speaker or announce when the Assembly is sitting that because of a division in my party, I am moving on to Party B. Now, if the Speaker or the Senate President yeah. accepts my letter or my declaration, then the matter might very well end there. Yes. But where he refuses, then the only option is to go to the courts to mm. get a declaration yes. that because there's a division in my party, I am entitled to move yes. to the other party. So, I mean, it's still a function for the judiciary to determine, one, whether there is even any division at all, at all, mm -hmm. or to determine whether, because I have moved to another party, I've lost my seat. If the Senate President or the Speaker of the House of Assembly or House of Reps accepts the letter and accepts that indeed there is a division, is there a recourse to the law for the party that is losing that seat? Of course, I mean, you know, any decision either way to either accept that there's a division or that there's no division, mm. any aggrieved party can go to court. Even if the Senate president 
or the Speaker, or either the House of Reps or the State House of Assembly, yes. accepts the declaration that there's a division, people will feel that there's no division, maybe the party itself, yes. or maybe constituents or who elected this member, yes. can always go to court to say no, even though the, the Senate President has said that there's a division, mm -hmm. there is no division. Mm -hmm. So the court will now look at the facts presented by both sides and arrive at a decision. Okay. Now, if this defection occurs in the executive, is there a penalty too in the Constitution? The Constitution has made no provision for what will happen in the event that either the president, the vice president, the governor or the deputy governor change camps, move from one party to the other. The Constitution mm. says nothing about that. Mm. And the Supreme Court has also said that so far as it concerns the executive arm of government, yes. there is nothing stopping them from decamping because the Constitution is silent on it. That came up in one of the Atiku and Obasanjo cases then, right. mm -hmm. and the Supreme Court you know, said it quite clearly and emphatically that as far as the executive arm is concerned, the penalties in section 67 and 109 yes. do not apply to them. Okay. So if your governor moves from party A to party B... There's nothing anyone can yes, do. Yes, by virtue of that, he doesn't lose his position mm -hmm. as governor. Is there a recourse to the law for the losing party, the party that loses a governor? There's no recourse because, you know I mean, if the law doesn't ban an activity, mm. then it means that if one carries it out, yes. it is the... Now we'll come to chapter 3 of the 1999 constitution and dual citizenship. I mean, we've often heard it said, you know, that some politically exposed person shouldn't be appointed or shouldn't be allowed to contest certain seats because they have dual citizenship, they hold passports of the United States, for instance, in addition to holding a passport from the Federal Republic of Nigeria. Is the law against this? Does the law say that our president, for instance, can't also have an American passport? On this issue, the law is not so settled. Mm. You know, there are people who contend that on one hand, if you hold dual citizenship, you're not entitled to mm. occupy these offices. Yes. But on the other hand, there is a decided case at yes. the Court of Appeal where it was said in 2004 that by virtue of the combined provisions of sections 25, 26, 27, 28 and 66 of the 1999 Constitution, yes. a Nigerian citizen by birth does not forfeit his citizenship or become ineligible to contest election to the House of Representatives simply because he's also a citizen of another country. Wow. What case is that? That's the case of Obeide versus Osula. Mm. It was decided by the Court of Appeal in 2004. And four. If a governor or the president also holds um, an American passport or a British passport, that doesn't disqualify them from being president. It doesn't disqualify them because I think one of the criteria is that you should be a citizen of Nigeria. Mm. And in so far as the Constitution does not state expressly that one, it doesn't bar dual citizenship. Mm -hmm. All it says is that you must be a citizen of Nigeria. It doesn't say you cannot be a citizen of Nigeria and a citizen of, of another, another country. country. Ah. So in my mind, that would permit people with dual citizenship to contest for offices. There's a debate, you know, mm -hmm. that goes to both sides. And I think ultimately it will be for the Supreme Court to now settle this aspect of the law clearly yeah. so mm -hmm. that we can now take a cue. Like for instance, the issue we just discussed as yes. to defections, defections yes. it's been settled quite clearly by the Supreme Court. Because when you have laws, the courts are there to interpret it. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, when you get to the Supreme Court and they give a pronouncement on it, that is the position of the law mm -hmm. because they have looked at the various provisions, they've interpreted it, and they, they, you know, then they give a definite position. As a date, I'm not aware of any Supreme Court decision on that. But like I said, there's that Court of Appeal 
decision, yes. which probably might still be on appeal, mm. and we'll wait for definite pronouncement by the Supreme Court on this issue. On, on this matter. So if the Supreme Court confirms this decision of the Court of Appeal or yes. changes it, yes. that then will be the position that of the law. That will be the definite position of the law until maybe the Supreme Court changes its mind. Mm. All right. Join us again after the break. So what is 60 Minutes with Angela all about? It's not an interview. I like to think it's a conversation between two people, people making the news, people who are in the news, and those who become the news. And the whole idea is to inform, to educate, or to clarify, as the case may be. It is an art getting people to answer the questions that everyone is thinking in their minds. And that's what we try to do on 60 Minutes with Angela. I ask all the questions that everyone's thinking about and no one wants to voice. All the questions you always wanted to ask, you get those answers on 60 Minutes with Angela. Every week on this station, 60 Minutes with Angela, getting answers to every question you always wanted to ask. Welcome back. My concluding moments now with Moyo Shuri Onigbanjo. Now, the Constitution makes a distinction between citizens by birth and those who naturalize. Can a citizen by birth lose his citizenship under any circumstances? A citizen by birth cannot lose his citizenship. Okay. Because, I mean, that's, that's where it comes from, naturally. But the distinction is that if uh, uh, somebody who acquires Nigerian citizenship under the Constitution, i.e. is not a Nigerian by birth, can lose his citizenship mm -hmm. under Section 28. Yes. If he takes up citizen of another country other than the country of his birth. Hmm. Let's break it down. Yes. So, I'm not British by birth. Yes. I'm not Nigerian by birth. Yes. I have acquired Nigerian citizenship, naturalized, yes. and I've also naturalized in Britain, even though I'm a French citizen. What does our constitution say? So under our constitution, in that scenario that you have given, yes. once you acquire British citizenship by naturalization, you are not British by birth, yes. you are not Nigerian by birth, but you have Nigerian citizenship, then you acquire British citizenship. Our constitution says you will lose your Nigerian citizenship. It's automatic? Yes, it is automatic. They will summon me to take the passport or, you well, know? Well, they will revoke, they will revoke it. Mm. Because, um, I mean, I believe, I don't know the procedure, but yes. I believe it will be by letter. Okay. Now we go to this matter that has been trending for a while forgery of the Senate standing rules following the elections in the National Assembly, the emergence of a Senate president and the Speaker of the House of Representatives. It has been alleged that the rules for carrying out that election were forged. Now the police have come out with their report, but they say that they're searching for a political solution. And I wanted us to look at the powers of the police and of course, side by side with the EFCC. The misconception from a lot of people that if the police moves, it's because they're acting from orders from above. If they don't move, it's also because orders from above are saying, don't move. In this scenario, why would the police be looking for a political solution? Is it not clear cut enough that if a for forgery has happened, it is a crime, and there should be a natural process that follows that. The criminal code defines what amounts to forgery when there is a forgery. Section 463, mm. it defines you know, what amounts to forgery, and I believe the onus is on the police to investigate. If an allegation is made, that the, sin the standing rules of the Senate mm. are forged. The responsibility to investigate that allegation of forgery rests on the Nigerian police. If they conduct their investigations and reach a conclusion that yes, 
those rules, those standing rules were indeed forged as alleged, then they should submit a report of investigation to the Office of the Director of Public Prosecution mm. with the DPP. The DPP will render an advice as to whether there is a prima facie case upon which the people who forged the said standing rules can be charged to court for the offense of forgery. If the DPP feels that yes, a case is made out that can stand scrutiny in a court of law, then charges are simply drafted and the accused persons are taken to court to defend themselves against that charge. Right. And that should ordinarily be the course of events that this should take. That you should know. ordinarily be the course yes, of events. Yes, that should be the sequence of events. Okay. It in shouldn't involve the executive or anybody else. It it's is. strictly a police duty. Yes, it is strictly a, a duty of the police in combination with the director of public prosecutions, mm. you know, and ultimately the matter ends up in court. The accused persons are innocent until proven guilty, so they have their day in court, they're entitled to be represented. I mean, that, that should be the way that the matter should go. Okay. Any other thing will be allowing impunity to reign over us. Because, I mean, if you say, we've read it in the papers, I'm not privy to the mm. conclusion anyway, Yes. but we've read it in the papers that, yes, the senior standing rules were forged. So fine, if that is the case, the police have said they're investigating, which is also fine, which is also due process. The next stage now should be the police to say, well, we have come to the end of our investigation, and we are of the view that there was a forgery or there was no forgery. If they say there was no forgery, the matter might end there. But if they say there's a forgery, then the next thing is for us, the machinery of the administration of justice to kick into gear. Does any part of the law require the police perhaps to submit their investigation to the president for vetting and approval? No, 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 no. There's no part of the law that requires that of okay. them. Okay. Although we know politically mm. that invariably the tenor of prosecution always looks at the body language of the executive. So that is why you see so many cases that ought to be prosecuted are either not prosecuted or even when they are prosecuted, they're not prosecuted diligently. Mm. Okay, and that also brings me to the question on the EFCC, the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission set up by law of 2002 as amended and part two talks about the functions of the, the commission. In the last couple of weeks and months we've seen the EFCC kick into gear, you know, going after perceived offenders and people looking at it and thinking these moves are political. If it's an opponent of, of the president they say it's a witch hunt. Does the EFCC need to get approval or permission from the executive, either the president or the governors of any state, before they move against anyone who they can consider to have done something against the EFCC law? Legally speaking, they do not need to obtain the permission of the executive to proceed to investigate anybody yes but then again we know that in our political space mm. prosecution is determined largely by what in quote has now been called the body language <laughs> of the president so where you have a president who wants to look the other way the EFCC too will have to look the other way yes but where you have a president who you can see from his body language that he does not tolerate, he does not stomach corruption, Yes. then I guess you see an EFCC that is more ready to bear its fangs mm. and go on the attack. And I believe what is happening now is testimony to the two different characters mm. that occupied the seats of President of Nigeria. Yes. In the previous dispensation, the EFCC was largely to be ignored because, you know, they, they, they couldn't bite. Mm. But since May 29, we have seen that the, the, their tempo has picked up. Yes. We have seen that they're going after more people, but not enough, in my view, considering the cesspool 
of corruption around us. But, you know, we can, at least we see that their tempo has increased. Even though you say the tempo has increased, someone said to me, what's the big deal if the EFCC invites you? So an invitation from the EFCC is still not a conviction, is it? No, far from it. It's not a conviction, but it's the ignition to your getting convicted. Mm -hmm. So you need to start by inviting people to respond to allegations against them. Then you take it to the next level. level. Okay, and when we see people who have been invited respond and say, you know, I'm not available until such and such a date. To the ordinary Nigerian on the street, it looks like cheating, you know. They think that the, the privilege or the elite are kind of dictating the terms. Whereas if it was the poorer people, they wouldn't have the liberty to be choosing the date on which they will answer the invitation. So what does the law say? Does the law allow me to choose a date that is convenient also to answer to that invitation? Or am I supposed to drop everything I'm doing to respond to an invitation from the EFCC? You see, with this, there are two issues you need to consider. One is that if I receive an invitation from the EFCC, and it is absolutely impracticable for me to honor that investigation, the EFCC has to take that into consideration. Right. So if you invite a man who is critically ill, he definitely would not be able to respond to that investigation. Mm -hmm. So common sense just di dictates that, okay, well, you give him more time mm -hmm. to respond. Yes. But where you see that the refusal to honor the invitation is more of an attempt to evade arrest mm -hmm. or to evade coming up to respond, yes. then it is in those cases that the EFCC can then apply to a court and say, give us a warrant of arrest or give us a warrant to search this person's premises yes. because of X, Y, Z reasons. Again, because like you said, the perception is that this has largely been abused mm. by, by a select few. Yes. People tend to think that, but you know, in investigating somebody, the EFCC must be careful not to even violate their fundamental rights because yes. they have rights. If you arrest somebody, you cannot keep him for more than 24 hours. That's what the law says. Mm. Do they obey that? Well, you know, I don't have any statistics yes. you know, to refer to, but experience says it is obeyed in the breach. Rather than in obeying it. Yeah, rather than to the letter of the law. An invitation comes from the EFCC, you respond to it or you don't. In going there to answer the invitation, is that deemed to be an arrest effectively? It is not deemed as an arrest, but in practice what happens is when you go there, if they see that they have enough facts to charge you, they yes. arrest you there upon and then they take you to court. When you get to court, you can now apply for bail. Okay. But where they see that the investigations are still continuing, mm. they now give you what they call administrative bail. So right. the EFCC or the police will say, okay, you can go, but you have to report back on such and such a okay. date because the investigation continues. And anyone who's invited by the EFCC should be worried, shouldn't they? It, it, is, it, it, it is a major thing. I mean, I know we've heard about false petitions and nasty petitions that have no basis at all or no foundation. But, you know, if there are issues... And yeah, you definitely. I mean, if you're, if you're invited in any, any sane society by law enforcement officers to, to respond to any allegations made against you, yes. I think you have cause to be worried. But the thing is that, well, you know, you need to go there to respond. If you're innocent of the charges or the allegations, you go there and you make your case to the concerned authorities that, look, these allegations against me are without substance. And it should end there. However, decide to go to court. That person also has the right to be represented by legal representation in court. Mm -hmm. And the matter will be left for a judge or a court to determine whether or not the allegations should be sustained. In your opinion, with this proliferation of laws with, that we have, we have the um, Special Fraud Unit, we have EFCC, ICPC, uh, do we need all these laws? Do we need to merge them? 
and just retain them under one police force. I particularly believe that there is no need for the duplication between the ICPC mm -hmm. and the EFCC because, I mean, you know, they're all investigating corrupt activities against the state. So, because now you have the EFCC, you have the ICPC, you have in the police, you have the... A SFU. S S special Fraud Unit. Mm. Then I believe you also have the Fraud Unit itself, mm -hmm. since that is a special one. Yes. So we're just duplicating all these roles. Mm. If the police, for example, is empowered, because what you find is that most of the officers in the EFCC and the ICPC and the Special Fraud Unit are yeah. called policemen, seconded from the police to these units. Mm. So perhaps if to save cost, to save duplication mm. of efforts, why not bring all these investigative units under one body, adequately armed by law to investigate all crimes against the state, economic crimes against the state. Yes. I think we will save time, we will save duplication of efforts, mm -hmm. and I think there will be unity of purpose as far as investigation of crimes go. Thank you very much, Mr. Tony Banjo, for coming back on the program. Thank you very and much. And thank you for watching. I'm Angela Ajitumobi. See you next time. <laughs>